Last time I introduced a mathematically minded crab, which was able to determine the dimensionality of its universe by measuring how much space it covered, moving different distances in every possible direction. And if you missed that episode, you might want to check it out now, since I'll be building on it in this episode. You'll find the link in the show notes. Now I'm going to use the same crabby method to determine the dimensionality of graphs generated by Wolfram Physics. I'm finally going to answer the question, how many dimensions are there in this universe? And the answer's going to be unexpected. Here's a hint. It's not two, and it's not three. Let's start with a simple graph. Now, I'm pretty sure I know the dimensionality of this graph. It's two-dimensional. From our God's eye perspective, that's pretty obvious. But let's do this from a crab's eye perspective, from inside the graph. Let's start from the node in the middle of the graph. Remember that our crab determined the dimensionality of its universe by measuring how much space it covered, moving different distances in every possible direction. To use the crab's method, first we need to decide the distance we're going to move. Well, in, in the crab's universe, the only obvious measure of distance was one crab length. In our graph, the only obvious measure of distance is one edge. Remember that the edges of the graph don't have any particular length. I mean, I've drawn all the edges of this graph the same length, about half an inch. Well, depending on the size of the screen that you're looking at right now. But I could have drawn all the edges different lengths, or I could have drawn them half a micron long, or half a mile long, and it would still be the same graph. So the only way to measure distance in the graph is to count numbers of edges. OK, following the crab's example, we're going to move one edge in every possible direction. You can see how a graph is different from the crab's continuous universe. The crab was able to move in an infinite number of directions, tracing out a circle. In this graph, however, we can only move in four directions from that middle node, along the four edges shown in red. Next, we need to decide how much space we've just covered. The only obvious measure of the amount of space the crab covered in its universe was the amount of space the crab took up itself. The only obvious measure of the amount of space we've covered in our graph is the number of nodes we've reached. Again, you can see how a graph is different from the crab's continuous universe. The amount of space the crab covered was measured in numbers of crabs, including fractions of a crab. The crab might cover 3.14 crabs worth of space, or 12.57 crabs worth of space. In the graph, however, we always reach a whole number of nodes. In this case, we've covered five nodes worth of space, including the one we started from and the four nodes we've just reached. So, by moving one edge in every possible direction, we've covered five nodes worth of space. R equals 1 gives us V equals 5. Now let's go two edges in every possible direction. By doing so, we reach 13 nodes, the five we reached within one edge, now shown in darker red, plus another eight we reach within two edges, now shown in brighter red. R equals 2 gives us V equals 13. We can keep doing this, moving 3, 4 and 5 edges in every possible direction. R equals 3 gives us V equals 25. R equals 4 gives us V equals 41. And R equals 5 gives us V equals 61. Remember how the two-dimensional crab found that the amount of space it covered increased with the distance it moved to the power of 2, and the three-dimensional crab found that it increased with the distance it moved to the power of 3? Well, we're going to do the same thing the crabs did to find out whether this graph is two-dimensional or three-dimensional. I'm going to spare you the mathematics, but every time we move one more edge, we can calculate whether v is increasing with r to the power of 2, or 3, or some other number. I'm going to call that number d, the dimensionality of the graph. If you're interested in the formula I use to calculate d, check out the footnote to the article that accompanies this episode. 
As ever, the link is in the show notes. So we can now measure the dimensionality of our simple graph. I'm going to start again from the node in the middle of the graph, and every time we move one more edge in every direction, I'm going to calculate d, the dimensionality of the graph. So, drum roll, it's d equals zero. Well, that's disappointing. All that work and our calculations tell us that this is a zero dimensional graph? That's obviously not right. Okay, let's move another edge in every direction. That gives d equals 1.38. Well, that's a bit better, but it's still wrong. After this second step, our calculations are telling us that this is a 1.38 dimensional graph, but we can clearly see that it's actually a two dimensional graph. Let's go another edge. That gives d equals 1.61. Closer, but still not right. What's happening here? Why can't our calculations get it right? This is not a 0 or a 1.38 or even a 1.61 dimensional graph. It's a two dimensional graph. Well, here's the problem. The Krabs universes, remember, were continuous. They could move in an infinite number of directions. This graph, however, is not continuous. We can only move along edges. On a large scale, the graphs of Wolfram physics are going to look continuous. But when we're starting out with our measurement of the dimensionality of the graph, we're operating on a small scale at which the graph is not continuous. The solution is to keep going. As we move ever more edges in every direction, the graph is an ever closer approximation to continuous space. So our calculation of d is an ever more accurate measurement of the dimensionality of the graph on a large scale. So after four steps, d equals 1.72. And after five steps, d equals 1.78. OK, now we run into another problem, the edge of the graph. If the two-dimensional crab ran into the edge of its universe, it would no longer be tracing out a circle. It would be kind of a squared-off circle. And the amount of space it covered would no longer increase with the distance it moved to the power of 2. It's the same for our graph. After six steps, we run into the edge of the graph, and d falls to 1.56. After seven steps, it falls to 1.17. So our calculation of the dimensionality of the graph is now falling away from two. So unfortunately for this small graph, we don't have a definitive number of dimensions. Our numbers start out wrong, 0, 1.38, 1.61, because the graph is not continuous. They get closer to the right answer, 1.72, 1.78, as we move an increasing number of edges in every direction. Then the numbers go wrong again, 1.56, 1.17, as we run up against the edge of the graph. To get the most accurate possible number of dimensions, we're going to have to ignore the numbers at the start and at the end of our measurement, and go with the value we converge on in the middle of our measurement. And we're not going to be able to find the dimensionality of a graph that's too small. So, let's try measuring the dimensionality of a larger graph. This starts exactly as the smaller graph did, with numbers that are too small, because the graph is not continuous. But the numbers do trend towards the right answer. r equals 5 gives us v equals 61, which gives us d equals 1.78. With this larger graph, however, we don't run into the edges so soon, and the number of dimensions d edges ever closer to 2. r equals 10 gives us v equals 221, which gives us d equals 1.9. r equals 15 gives us v equals 481, which gives us d equals 1.93. Now, d equals 1.93 isn't the answer we were expecting, which was d equals 2, but it's close. When we do run into the edges of the graph, the numbers go wrong again r equals 20 gives us v equals 741, which gives us d equals 1.19. Still, as long as we go big and stay away from the edges, we can get a reasonable approximation of the dimensionality of the graph. Now let's level up a dimension. 
I might be jumping the gun here, but this graph looks kind of three-dimensional to me. We're going to use the same Krabby method as ever. Starting at the node in the middle of the graph, we're going to measure how much space we cover moving different distances in every possible direction, and determine whether that amount of space increases with the distance to the power of 2, or to the power of 3, or to some other power. As ever, we start out with the wrong answer, because the graph is not continuous. R equals 1 gives us V equals 7, which gives us D equals 0. D equals 0 obviously is wrong, this is not a zero-dimensional graph. But we soon start trending towards the right answer. R equals 3 gives us V equals 63, which gives us D equals 2.28. Until, that is, we run into the edges of the graph when it all goes wrong again. R equals 5 gives us V equals 195, which gives us D equals 2.07. We didn't get to the answer we were expecting, D equals 3, because we didn't go big enough. So let's go larger. With a bigger three-dimensional grid, we come much closer to D equals 3. R equals 5 gives us V equals 231, which gives us D equals 2.61. And R equals 10 gives us V equals 1561, which gives us D equals 2.83. Now, at last, we can apply our method for measuring the dimensionality of a graph to one that's been generated by one of the rules of Wolfram physics. Any guesses what the answer will be? Remember, we're going to have to ignore the numbers at the start and at the end of our measurement, and go with the value we converge on in the middle of our measurement. It doesn't really matter which node we start with, since there's no middle to this graph, so I'm going to start with the one at the bottom. After a few steps, the number of dimensions goes over 2. r equals 5 gives us v equals 44, which gives us d equals 2.03. A couple of steps further, it goes over 3. r equals 7 gives us v equals 116, which gives us d equals 3.37. Then we hit the limits of the graph and the number goes back down. r equals 9 gives us v equals 196, which gives us d equals 1.31. You can see that it doesn't matter whether the graph has edges, like the grids we were looking at earlier, or whether it wraps back on itself, like this one. Either way, when we run out of edges to move along, the calculation goes wrong. OK, let's go back to that number we reached, d equals 3.37. It's a small graph, so this is just an approximation, but it looks like this graph is at least 3.37 dimensional. What does this mean? How can dimensionality be fractional? I mean, I can imagine what a two-dimensional universe might look like, and I know for sure what a three-dimensional universe looks like, but what would a 3.37-dimensional universe look like? And is it possible that we might live in a universe that's more than three-dimensional? In the next episode of The Last Theory, I'm going to ask a deeper question to try to make sense of this 3.37-dimensional graph. What are dimensions? Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast, or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.